welcome and thank you for, for being here, Sylvia. Um, for you guys that don't know Sylvia on social media, she goes by the biohacking chick uh, and has done a lot of biohacking self-experimentation, some really fascinating stuff, but she has a, you know, an interesting background. And then she started a company with, with the assistance of some other folks called Carnivore Snacks, which we'll talk about, uh, which is just basically meat, which is just delicious. I mean, I've had several samples, fortunately, and they're wonderful. But let Sylvia, if you don't mind, would you give a, a, a people a little maybe five, 10 minutes story about what, who you are. I know you had a time where you were vegan, you had some horrible necrotizing fasciitis and you got it looks like a bear attack, two type stuff. So tell us your little backstory real quick and then I'll let people ask questions. Uh, maybe some of the experiments you've done and you know, we can go on from there. So I have been vegan in the past for total three years, raw vegan, then I was a uh, fruitarian for one year um, and that had tremendous negative uh, brain, uh, impact on my brain. I was severely depressed from that. And then afterwards experimented with keto. And then, like you mentioned, I went through horrible um, necrotizing fasciitis and that just destroyed my gut. Um, and I started experimenting with carnivore diet and now two and a half, no, not and a half, but over two years now, I've been on carnivore diet and um, I want to say um, I'm thriving but at the same time I just um, I'm kind of struggling right now because what I've discovered is plant uh, breast implant illness now which I had breast implants for a long time and um, this is kind of what um, it's killing me now so um, yeah that's pretty much the the summary of the past and what's happening right now and along the ways, you know, carnivore snacks uh, started to from the desperate need of having steak on the go. <laughs> so one of the things uh, I'm just wondering, uh, you know, your effort, I mean, you, you, you went uh, vegetarian, vegan for a while, you went fruitarian. What drove you to do that? What was it? What was the component? Was it health? Was it just, I want to save the animals? I think it's a better thing for the environment. What was the, what was got you to go that, down that road? It was basically for the environment. I've watched all the documentaries and, you know, I was born and raised in Poland and I knew how in Poland we treated our animals. So I knew that wasn't the case uh, back there, but here in the US, it kind of scared me. It let me believe that, you know, the animals are treated like that everywhere in the US. So that kind of encouraged me to just give up meat. And I thought I was gonna, save the planet by going vegan and you know my health deteriorated even faster um by going vegan and i already was eating clean so by going vegan it didn't help me at all i like i started noticing negative um, health effects very quickly but i still was super determined to stay on it just to save the environment yeah, and I, I see a lot of folks, unfortunately, they, they tie their ideology into their, their health. And, you know, it's hard to save a plant when you can't even save yourself, you know, and you're sick. Sick people do not make for a healthy planet. And I think that's, exactly. uh, that's an important thing to understand. And, you know, the fact, however animals are raised, and, and I'm not defending animal cruelty, but however they're raised does not change our biological need to eat them, you know, regardless. And, you know, yes, we should all strive to uh, make it as good as practical. You know, obviously these animals are still going to be slaughtered, so on and so forth. Let's talk a little bit about uh, the necrotizing fasciitis. For you guys who don't know what that is, it's basically a severe, severe, aggressive, often fatal infection uh, that occurs, you know, in, in the layers of the skin and it basically just spreads like wildfire. It can, it can, it can, it can cover huge swaths of the body and it becomes a surgical nightmare. Lots of antibiotics, often lots of operations are used to control it. So how did that occur? And what was, what, what was, a, what was a sort of the sequelae and how did that play out? How long did you deal with that? Um, well, it started, um, I think it was 2018 when I started having first weird infections. Then um, I got bitten by a, a brown recluse on my leg and that turned out to be a MRSA too later when they tested um, uh, for the infection. And then months after, but they didn't give me proper antibiotics for it. Um, they just gave me a cream, a steroid cream to put on it and then antibiotics that didn't work. Um, but the infection did seem to go away. And then a couple months later, 
um, I had little tiny pimple under, underneath my stomach that literally grew into this snake size infection underneath my skin. It spread all the way up to my ribs um, and it spread very quickly, very quickly. It was literally overnight. And then um, next day um, I basically was in ER and doctors had no idea what it was. Um, and they were, they flew in specialists, um, all kinds of different doctors and they couldn't figure it out because I did not know that the thing that I had on my leg was caused by MRSA. If I had known that, they probably right away could figure it out. Um, and when they tested me in the hospital, they um, took the nose uh, swab first, but that came back negative. Um, and the, the culture test takes, uh, I think, three or four days for the results to get back. So meanwhile, I had to go through surgeries to clean the infections up. Um, and they were treating me with a bunch of different antibiotics, but unfortunately, none of them work quickly enough. Um, some of the ones that were, they were treating me for MRSA, my body was clearing up very quickly and they weren't effective. So I went through three back-to-back -back surgeries to clean it up. And now if you see my scars on Instagram, a lot of people are wondering what they're from, if I was fighting some sort of animal for meat or something, but no, it's from necrotizing fasciitis. Um, I wish I had a better story about that, but no, that's just from that. Yeah, but yeah, I ended up in ICU for five days, um, left afterwards and then the healing journey began and it was, it was hard because I couldn't literally eat anything after so many antibiotics that was, my body was uh, pumped with. So yeah, I actually went back to cooked uh, vegan diet thinking that I could heal my gut that way. That didn't last long. Maybe I went for two weeks and after that I was just desperate. I knew that it wasn't working and I found carnivore diet and yeah, two years now and it's been amazing pretty much. Yeah, and it's just for you guys who don't know, I mean, if you look, she's got, a, it looks like a bear literally took its claw and went right across the side of her abdomen. I mean, it's just, when I first saw it, I said, God, it looks like you got attacked by a bear. But uh, thank goodness you came through that. I mean, there are people that, that certainly, you know, end up much worse than than, than you do yeah. or you have with, with necrotizing effects. Some people lose, you know, lose limbs and things like that, which is just awful. Um, so what, um, I mean, how did you go from vegan to carnivore? I mean, there's, you know, a lot of people will say, well, it's one extreme to the other. Uh, why not just do a balanced diet? Why not go on a, you know, a whole food clean, you know, I'll never stop. Or, or did you try that? What was it? What was it? What was it rationale just to go from one, what, what our people would are extreme to what a lot of people here do, which many people also consider extreme. What was it? What was a compelling reason to try going full carnivore? Right. Well, in between, I in between vegan and carnivore, I did end up trying trying pretty much everything, like counting the macros, um, the ketogenic diet, the balanced diet, uh, you know, the the bro diet, you know, and I've tried it all. And at the point, I uh, ketogenic diet did help me a little bit, but then I started developing a lot of cravings, a lot of binge eating. I would never feel satisfied. I tried you know, uh, following the macros that they were recommending at that time. And at some point I did the plant-based keto and I was measuring my ketones and my ketones were super high, but on the meter, but it didn't make me feel any better. So I'm like, what does it matter? You know, my ketones are high, but I feel like shit, you know, I have low energy. Everything is not feeling good at all. So um, from there, I started noticing like just the weird reactions to Brussels sprouts, asparagus, even things like romaine lettuce. Um, I was constantly bloated. And at that time, I already wasn't eating many fruits. Um, so I didn't think it had to do anything with like sugar or insulin or anything like that. Um, so then I started eliminating stuff and nuts were causing a lot of issues. So that's kind of what led me um, to carnivore, eliminating all that plant toxins that they're saying that are, you know, beneficial, that they uh, cause hormesis or whatever it may be, but they were killing me, essentially. I was sleepwalking most of the time, and I, I just had to do something to fix that. 
Yeah, and you know, I guess given, and we certainly know now that antibiotics can have a deleterious effect on the gut and the gut microbiome. I think that's pretty well accepted at this point. So, you know, when you are dealing with a huge infection, like a life-threatening infection, I mean, using antibiotics are not something you typically just negotiate about and use it. Some powerful vancomycin, genomycin, some of these really powerful medications that have often nephrotoxicity, and certainly they have, uh, which, you know, would hurt the kidneys, and they have... Uh, effects on the gut, which we just talked about. So it's, it's important to realize that that really wasn't a choice, I don't think. I mean, if I had neck fascia, I'd definitely take antibiotics. I mean, there's no doubt about it. And I'd probably have, you know, obviously the surgeries too are probably the main thing to get it out of there. And so thank goodness you have for that. Now, um, so tell me about the transition to carnivore diet. How did it occur? And I know you've done a lot of experimenting. You know, you know you've done it. Let's, let's talk about some of those experiments because I know a lot of people have questions. And what about this? What about that? And you've kind of been pretty rigorous about testing at least some of the some of the thoughts about that so talk about your transition to carnivore and let's talk about some of the various experiments you've done uh when i did transition i started out pretty much with eating any type of meat i could um it didn't matter if it was chicken if it was uh lamb beef pork um and i was eating a lot i felt like i was binge eating and that was kind of like terrifying to me at the beginning but then I decided you know what like my body is so deprived of nutrients like this is what it needs so I would just wake up in the morning have a huge breakfast of just copious amounts of meat um, and then sometimes I wouldn't have to eat till 3 p.m. I might have another small meal at that time and then not eat till the next day and it was kind of like naturally I would eat two meals a day and be fine and be satisfied with uh, with that. Um, later on, I kind of tried uh, started eliminating things like chicken um, and pork, and I was just eating basically for a year just steak, um, water, and salt. And it wasn't always that I could afford, you know, grass fed, even though I, you know, I do. I, I tried to do my best to afford it, you know, but sometimes it wasn't possible. So even on store-bought meat, I was thriving, you know, and I understand not everybody will be able to afford grass-fed, the best type of meat out there. But I do believe that a lot of people can still heal on store-bought meat, you know, and then later if they choose to, they can transition to grass-fed if that's something that they can afford. So like I said, for me, it wasn't necessarily 100% grass fed all the time. Whenever I could, that's what I did. Um, I was reacting to eggs, so it wasn't something that I, at the beginning I was eating. Now I do tolerate them pretty okay. Um, dairy, um, I eliminated that it was because it was highly inflammatory for me. Um, and I still don't do it maybe once a month. I'll, eat um, Greek yogurt, but then I'll break out and, you know, zits and have a lot of blem blemishes on my skin. So I avoid that now too. But um, like I said, at the beginning, I went from eating a lot, a lot of meat. And I was kind of worried thinking that if I'm going to have to eat that much on a daily basis, I'm going to go broke very fast. But later I feel like as my body healed and, um, my satiation kind of kicked in, I was able to uh, lower the amounts I was eating and still thriving and feeling pretty amazing. So yeah, right now I'm, you know, two years into it and um, I probably eat around two pounds of meat most of the days, but there are days where I can just smash like six pounds of meat, like, and my family will look at me like, where is that going you know yeah that, that, i'm always I, I hear about this from time we had ella bruce on her saying she was eating five five pounds of meat a day every day you know just and and, and you know i've i've you know, i've met sylvia in fact you guys know we sylvia and i were in a, a german documentary called galileo about old oh, maybe a year and a half ago or actually coming up on two years now i think and yeah. they put us through our paces and film spent all day filming us and fed us some nice steaks by the way it was quite, quite yeah amazing. that was amazing but uh so that's that was pretty cool now, so talk about some of the some of the actual testing the biohacking stuff now you uh, i know you did one experiment where you looked at your micronutrient levels uh, you compared a month or so of grass finish versus a month or so of grain finished beef. Tell us a little bit about the results you discovered when, when you did some, some sort of 
testing on that stuff. Yeah, so when I did test um, for the omega-3s, I did an experiment when I did everything, just grass-fed beef, and that was mainly uh, New York strips and some uh, ribeyes. Then I did one that was all basically Costco steaks, and again, it was ribeyes and New York strips, and then I did uh, I had results from when I was keto, and then again when I did um, so, uh, some combination of a little bit chicken, fish here and there, and then mostly um, beef. And the higher omega threes to six were basically where I was eating seafood twice a week, maybe or twice, yeah, twice a week. And that, that was when I was um, having like the best ratio, whatever the best ratio really is, you know, it, it's not to say that I was feeling any better when my omega-3s were higher. I felt no change um, across the board. Um, the, the omega-3s on grass-fed meat were uh, slightly higher than the ones from Costco meat but it was very, very slight change from one to the other. So there wasn't anything significant in terms of, you know, um, doing that. I haven't tested for, for glyphosate. Now everybody is super scared of glyphosate and, and the commercial meat. Um, I don't know how true is that, how, you know, how that it impacts the animal. They do have a their own detoxification system. So I don't know how much of that ends up in the meat. Um, maybe someday I'll do the test for the glyphosate in the meat uh, that's grass fed and, and one that is not, but that's probably sometime in the future. So uh, that were the, uh, those were the results from my testing. Um, what else? Uh, then I did experiment with um, the higher fat and lower um, protein and then, you know, uh, higher protein and lower fat. And what I have found that there's a lot of information out there of people saying like, oh, if you go above 40% of lean protein, then the protein turns into ammonia in the body, and then you will suffer side effects from that. Um, in my case, what I have noticed, um, I went up to 80% protein and 20% fat, and I did notice I wasn't feeling good. Um, and a lot of that was converting into ammonia. So, and I, and I was feeling kind of brain foggy and sleepy, didn't have much energy. Um, the higher fat, I did feel better. But um, another thing what I did experiment with, if I added digestive enzymes to the higher protein um, macros, then I wasn't experiencing a lot of the ammonia side effects. So I do think that how, uh, you know, that digestion affects um, the breakdown of the nutrients as well. And I've noticed that uh, heavy supplementation of digestive enzymes are helping me a lot. And many people don't need that, but I've, I'm taking about 3.5 grams of HCl, hydrochloric um, acid, and I'm not noticing any burning in my gut. So that kind of tells me that I might need even more. Um, but yeah, I think that digestive issues will have a lot of um, effect on how the nutrients can be utilized by the body. So some people might need that. Yeah, interesting. Um, I One thing I think you, 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 you did, and I don't think you mentioned, is you, you did a lot of testing for advanced like mineral and vitamin deficiencies. Can you comment on that a little bit? Yeah. Um, so I did that um, before I tested, first time I tested it was on ketogenic diet and I was deficient in a lot of nutrients. And at that time I was also supplementing with a lot. Um, and then I tested on carnivore diet and all of my nutrients were a pretty um, a balanced. So everything, it wasn't, I wasn't deficient in anything and I wasn't overloaded with anything either. So it was nice to see that without supplementation on carnivore diet, which was mostly just steaks, water, and salt, um, I wasn't eating heavily um, organ meats or anything like that, maybe some chicken liver here and there. Uh, but 
it seemed like it wasn't necessary at that time for me to to consume that and my levels were amazing yeah and that's 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 kind of interesting to see and I, you know and I, one thing one caveat i'll say is sometimes a blood test don't accurately reflect yeah. tissue levels but nonetheless you know you showed that even in the serum it was it was fine um, you know, the comments about glyphosate, you know, being in meat and so on and so forth. I mean, my question, you know, would be uh, cows eat oxalates, cows eat glycoalloids, yeah. cows eat all these other toxins that bother people. Do we worry about those as well? Uh, glyphosate, the concentration of glyphosate is infinitesimally smaller than the amount of, say, uh, oxalates and other foods that cows are eating. And so they do have a detoxification system and, and you know, they would... You know, that's one of the things that's been looked at, you know, mammalian processing system for glyphosate. It doesn't really tend to accumulate, you know, or at least it's not shown to. So I think that's a misplaced concern. Uh, I do think that, you know, we can improve our agricultural systems. Uh, what did glyphosate replace? Uh, Paraquat, which is infinitely worse for us than, than what glyphosate is. And not to defend glyphosate and defend herbicides or pesticides, but I think the concerns are, are maybe somewhat overblown. Having said that, I do think we should get away from fertilizers and pesticides and, and practice more regenerative agriculture just for soil health and for, you know, runoff and those types of things. But I, I, I do think there's a little bit of, you know, uh, extra paranoia around these things. And it's, it's kind of making a mountain out of a molehill. I mean, you know, the people that have sued successful for glyphosate are people that are spraying it on, living in it, bathing it. And even then, it's kind of like, well, maybe that maybe the cancer was caused by that. Maybe it wasn't. We can't say with 100% certainty. So I don't, uh, again, I don't really worry about minor things as much. You know, if, if somebody's saying I don't, they're worried about glyphosate and meat and they're still eating Twinkies, I, I just have to laugh at those folks. And so, I mean, it's kind of like, uh, you know, you got you to pick your, your you, know, you got you to pick the big picture and make common sense. So that's a commentary there. And so I know that that will probably not sit well with some people, but I really am kind of a big picture type of person. And I think we have bigger battles to fight than, than, than that particular one. Uh, and I think we, you know, as we see the, the good thing about this sort of, and I know this is all editorializing right now in the middle of the interview, but I know the good thing is that, you know, this, this sort of, strain on the meat system is making us really critically look at it. I think that's a good thing. And I think hopefully if enough people uh, voice their opinions, we can see a change. So let's transition a little bit into carnivore snacks because that, that kind of segues into this because you are sourcing that from White Oaks Pasture. Uh, for you guys who don't know, that's Will Harris's place out in Bluffton, Georgia. And I've interviewed Will, he's a wonderful guy. He is a guy who, uh, Epic Bar bought by, I think General Mills, I think it was General Mills. I paid to have eighty thousand dollars to survey his land, and they showed that there was an absolute positive net uh, carbon sink that was occurring. So therefore, they were they were increasing the carbon in the soil more than they were they were utilizing. So, talk to us about the creation of carnivore snacks. Where did the idea come from? Talk about this the, the getting it off the ground because I know it's not easy. And talk about where you are now. I know you're either launching or getting ready to launch. And I, I can tell you wholeheartedly, without, I mean. It's a wonderful product. Tastes delicious. Uh, I, I found. I, I, she sent me a pack of uh, a ribeye, and I mean, I was getting ready to cook dinner. I just ate the whole damn pack and steaks. So I was like, "This is better than my ribeye." So I just kind of turned the whole package into a meal. So, so talk about the evolution of, of carnivore snacks, if you don't mind. Well, it did start because of the carnivore diet. So I have to thank you because uh, your interview with Joe Rogan was probably the first time I, I've watched. So, you know, after transitioning to carnivore, I started working for a company, a she meat company. I was a salesperson for a meat company. And I had to travel all over um, California uh, in a car. And I couldn't always stop and grab something really quickly and, and go. So um, that's kind of how it started. I just wanted to be able also to travel anywhere without, you know, needing to figure out if there's like any place that I could buy meat, a good steak, which usually even at the airports, they're so overpriced. It's crazy. Um, so that's basically how the idea came. And my aunt, she actually owns a, a dog treat company and she uh, was already kind of making something similar and she had a commercial dehydrator. So that allowed me to kind of test my own ideas and make my own samples just like and food for myself when I was traveling. 
So I used that. Then, you know, she kind of encouraged me to look into selling it. And at first I, I thought I was going to start selling it at Etsy or I don't know, somewhere, you know, small. And then I reached out to my business, now business partner, Mark, um, who takes care of all the marketing and all that stuff. Um, he's like, okay, well, let's build a website. I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm like, I just want to make it small. <laughs> and he's like, no, this is a great idea. Then I sent him some samples and he loved it. And um, he kind of um, said like, how about I'll be your business partner. I'll take care of the whole marketing thing, which I'm not so good at. So I'm like, okay, perfect. I'll be in charge of production. He's in charge of marketing and um, that's kind of how it all started, but now getting it off the ground is a little bit more tricky, mostly because you would think that the simpler the, the uh, product is, the easier it will be to make, but it's actually the very opposite. If you just want to make it meat and salt, <laughs> basically, you have to go through all these regulations through USDA. You have to follow all these uh, laws and rules when you're making it. And it's just crazy. They definitely don't make it easier, easy on anyone. And again, like sourcing meat um, has been a little bit challenging, but then Mark uh, knows uh, Diana Rogers and she kind of told us about like old pastures. And then through all of that, we connected with other farms who practice the same regenerative farming as like old pastures. So that way we can um, have backup in, in case Wagle Pastures is not um, ready to provide. But we also went to Georgia, we visited them. We met um, with the owner, with his daughter. They were amazing, amazing people. And that's kind of like how we felt like, okay, th these are the people we wanna work with. And they've been such help um, with everything as well, just connecting us with other farms um, as a backup that, that was um, really generous of them too. So this has been, you know, it started probably last year, maybe exactly a year ago. And we've been hoping to launch way sooner than now. Uh, first we were hoping for November, then we switched to December. And then it's been just a crazy ride just because of the regulations and the things that we want to do. We want to keep everything basically sourced and made in the U.S. And I have learned so much about meat, just sourcing meat. It's crazy that what I'm getting from white bull pastures, I could get grass fed from outside of U.S. for half the price. And it's just crazy to me that all the import, all that stuff from New Zealand, it still ends up being way expensive, way less expensive than a meat that I source from a local farmer. And it's the same thing with even bags. If I wanna make bags in US, it's more expensive if I wanted to go and get them from China, you know? So we're trying to keep everything um, in the US, made in US, sourced from US. Um, and that's kind of like uh, the whole thing behind carnivore snacks, not just providing a really good quality uh, product, but at the same time, just keeping it in the US um, and keeping the business here. Yeah, I saw that, uh, and I and I, I got a lot of commentary on this on my social media. I saw Trump, Donald Trump, said that you know maybe it's maybe we'll stop Im yeah. importing meat. You know, basically, is what his implication was. You know, because we are seeing farmers currently, you know, being asked to euthanize their 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 animals while we're importing meat from. You know, obviously we. And, and to be fair, I mean, most people don't realize that most of our meat, most of our imported meat, comes from Canada and Mexico, and then behind that comes New Zealand, Australia. Very little comes from other places. Brazil, we, we got some and then we had a moratorium because they had sort of problems with the practices. They had some sanitary problems. So Brazilian meat was banned for a while. I know we, we started looking at importing like Namibian meat, which is, if you guys know what Namibia is, it's, it's in Southern Africa on the, on the uh, Atlantic coast. Um, but so it's kind of interesting. You know, there's a lot of, lot of back and forth about free trade and prices and why is it that we can get meat from New Zealand from the other side of the world when we have a farmer, you know, literally 20 miles away from us and why it would cost more? Can you call, can you, do you have any insight? I know when we get my calicrate on here, we'll get, get into that in great de detail, but why is it, what, what is causing the U.S. meat to be more expensive for you as a 
you know, kind of as a, a third party supplier? What, what's the deal on that? I honestly, I, I don't know, to be honest, I have no idea why it is that when, you know, when you do the math, it seems like um, just paying for the shipping for the import and for the labor that, you know, that's outside of the US that you make the product on the ship or a plane or whatever, it should have cost more. So I, to be honest, I have no idea. I have no idea because again, like we're sourcing from Georgia um, and I don't know. I don't know if they're doing things differently, if they're raising the animals differently, when it costs more to, um, to get the meat, to process the meat. I have no idea. I mean, yeah. I, like I mentioned, it, I was, go ahead. I mean, yeah, I mean, I've got some, I, I got some insight in this. I think a lot of it has to do with USDA processing and the, and the expense to have USDA processing. Because if you want to sell your meat, you've got to have a, uh, you know, particularly across state lines and, 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 and small and batches like that, you have to have a USDA processor inspect the meat uh, and you have to, he has to be on site 24 seven basically, or have, or, or every day he has to be on site, not 24 seven and you have to supply an office for, for that person. So that's, you know, that's like a million dollar investment, you know, with salary, facilities, office stuff. Uh, so it's, um, that's part of it. There's some other reasons as well, but that's, that's part of the issue there, I think. And I don't know. And I know that imported meat still has to pass through USDA inspection, but it's not 24, 20, it's not seven days a week that you're, that you're there being watched. So that may have something to do with that. Um, let me ask you a little bit more about the product because I've had the, the ribeye, I've had the pork loin. I think it was, maybe it was a top sirloin. I can't remember. What are the cuts you guys are offering? What are you planning on doing? Um, can you talk about the process? Because it's not quite beef jerky. I mean, it's got a different taste of beef jerky and it's only beef and salt. I think you guys have been using red and real salt, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. It's another, another good company. I mean, I think it's good people. But um, what is the process like? How does it distinguish itself from from regular little beef jerky that we see in the, in the, in the gas station. <laughs> so, um, so the, um, like you said, we only use meat and we try to, we are using high quality meat and just Redmond uh, real salt. And then what we are not using is the vinegars, apple cider vinegar and other marinades, um, spices. I definitely wanted to keep it without any spices and Again, if people want some flavor to it, they can always add whatever's their, their fit, uh, flavor seasoning to the bag, just shake it up and you have whatever you prefer. But for myself, I just enjoy the, the you know flavor of just meat and salt. So we just wanted to make it simple. And for those people who do react to um, spices, just you know make it uh, friendly for them so they can enjoy it and eat it. So how is it different? It's definitely not chewy. Like I said, it's not, it's not like biltong where, you know, it's biltong is definitely better than, than like regular jerkies, but there's, they're always soaked in something in order to make up for the weight because the way we're making it is just essentially just dried meat and the weight is very light. So this is why, why most jerky companies are using the marinades and in order to preserve the meat in the first place, but also to make the weight, make it profitable. Um, so that's one thing. And we're kind of, it's more like a meat chip rather than a jerky consistency. Some people have called it meat pastry. Um, Danny Vega uh, keeps saying that's a meat pastry. Um, it, it does kind of have that consistency. It's kind of crumbly, I would say, depending on the cut. Um, right now we are, we have launched our Kickstarter and actually today is the last day for the, um, for people to pledge, but with the Kickstarter, we've launched with, with um, ribeye, we've launched with uh, pork loin and eye round. Um, those who have pledged certain amount will also have a choice to get lamb. And eventually we are, uh, we are wanting to expand to other cuts of meat, um, perhaps include something like uh, organ meats and stuff like that. And maybe chicken, I don't know if people would be interested much in chicken, but it definitely, 
I've um, experimented with it. It came out amazing. Yeah, she smells like uh, freshly baked bread. And it's amazing to like dip in ghee or, or butter, whatever it may be. But I know that, you know, carnivore community doesn't essentially necessarily like meat, uh, chicken. So I don't know if, if it's going to happen. We're probably going to survey people and ask if they would be interested in that. Um, so those are sort of our plans. But again, we need the money in order to source the meat, in order to make the packaging. And with any new uh, cut, we're going to have to have a designer create another design for the specific cut. So it's, uh, you know, more money, more money. So right now we just wanted to do four for now and get it going and see how things go, how people like it and essentially expand to more possibly wild game meats like venison. Um, we have a possibility of working with North Star Bison, um, who is another amazing farm and um, so those are the plans and this is kind of what's happening uh, right now. Yeah, I, I find that, uh, you know, I think the description, I like the pork one, some people are talking about, um, uh, you know, like a chip, they're almost like, a, they, they almost are like a potato chip. And I think it's interesting to, to, to realize that, you know, a lot of the jerkies, the commercial jerkies, we see that as pump full of fluids to increase the weight, the sales weight. So they can say, oh, this is eight ounces and most of it's fluid. As many people, may or may not know meat is mostly water guys i mean it's like 70 percent water i mean when you get a fresh cut of meat from a store 70 percent of what you're eating is water and so when they sell beef jerky uh you know they're they're you know when you're drying it completely like you do and i know you do an extensive drying process here it's just the nutrition it's not the water part of it so it's you know even though it's, it's lighter it's 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 just packed with nutrition which is really really kind of cool. Um, I, I don't know that chicken would not necessarily sell in the carnivore community. I think it tastes good. It tastes good. And I think uh, uh, there, there are people that certainly eat a lot of chicken thighs. And and I know the nice thing about the, you know, and again, for those people that like the higher fat, I know the the ribeye has the fat in it. And, so, and that's one of the things that reasons I was attracted to biltong is because it does often retain the fat. And I think biltong, they use vinegar as one of the, one of the curing agents or the preparation agents so but it, it is definitely unique it's a unique product it, it really tastes good i really wish you uh a lot of success with that i think we have to get get you linked onto our website you know on meter x i just i just looked to see if we had you on there i don't see us on there and i think we might have talked about that before so i'll bring that back up with uh, uh masa i guess in the near future um, do you, so somebody's asking, and I, I don't know if how much you want to talk about this, but somebody's asking, you want to go back to this sort of stuff with the breast implants. Um, how are you, how is that affecting you? How do you know it's that? What, what's the, what's the, what's the reason? I mean, are you, do you have to have them removed or, I mean, I was one of the, a couple of the, a couple of the, the guests in your assets. I don't know if you want, if you want to yeah. discuss um, that or not. This is something that actually came to my attention probably a week ago, and I started researching that um, when I, I've had breast implants since I was 19, and for whatever reason, women have their own reasons. I'm not going to talk about that. Um, and I never thought twice about looking into what is actually in a breast implant itself. I asked my surgeon, and he, of course, said, oh, no, they're absolutely 100% safe. FDA approved all that stuff. So I didn't think twice about looking into what's in them. And when I was 19, I got the saline ones. Um, later, probably like four years ago, I switched to silicone by the recommendation of my surgeon. He said that now it's all clear, they're perfectly safe. And, you know, I consider myself a smart person, but I never thought about, you know, um, having a foreign object in my body that my body is probably um, going to be tried to protect me against it. This is why there's a capsule that forms around the implant and that capsule holds all the viruses, infections, um, and other stuff that are uh, and heavy metals. And the, uh, the implants, both saline and silicone, the both actually have silicone in them and they contain heavy metals and other very dangerous toxins as well that leach out no matter what. They don't have to break. As long as they're in your body, your body will try to probably dissolve it or remove it in some sort of way. So as soon as you put that stuff in, that those things are gonna start leaching out and affecting um, your body in one way or another. And 
Um, I'm, kind, I'm kind of angry with myself because I've went through all these health issues that I feel like were probably amplified by all these toxins in my body. And last year when I moved to Arizona, I just started feeling worse and worse and I couldn't figure out what was going on. I went through heavy metal testing and it came back as super high in mercury and tin. And, you know, I went to my uh, functional medicine doctor and he kind of said, like, what do you think? Maybe it's your breast implants. And I thought to myself, I'm like, you know, it kind of like scared me because I didn't want to face it. You know, it's been with me for so long and for, um, for so many reasons. And yes, I am ready, uh, getting ready to remove them in a week, actually. And it is a emotional roller coaster and because, you know, it's not going to look pretty, pretty. And, and I kind of go through this thing in my head, you know, like I'm still single, like who's going to want to deal with all this mess, you know, but at this point I'm so freaking sick that I don't care. I just want to get this thing out of my body. And I know that it's, a, that's the reason for um, me feeling so sick now, essentially sleepwalking. A lot of the gut issues as well, which many women don't realize that can stem from it. Um, anything from skin rashes, a lot of um, autoimmune diseases that are being misdiagnosed, even um, things like um, Epstein-Barr, things like Lyme disease, because um, the implants can actually start growing mold in them, especially if they have the little valves in them, they'll start um, uh, growing bacteria and things like that. And going back to my necrotizing fasciitis, um, those, because of breast implants, you can also be more susceptible to um, infections such as MRSA and, and necrotizing fasciitis. So going back and looking at all my health history with the gut issues, with my hormones and stuff like that, I am pretty sure that those things did affect me uh, in, a, in a very negative way. They definitely didn't contribute to any of that. Um, and you know, even going carnivore has eliminated all these plant toxins that have been affecting my body negatively. But now I'm getting to a point where I'm starting to even react to meat, certain meat, unless I eat it raw then I can react to anything that has a little bit more collagen in it, which has been so frustrating because I keep going back and forth, back and forth. And, you know, this is like the only thing that I feel is holding me back to uh, fully really um, healing, you know? So I know many women are not ready to hear that. I wasn't, you know, I had few Instagram followers tell me like, listen, maybe this is the problem for or the reason for all the issues that you've been going through and I was just kind of like yeah whatever I read it kind of let it go until now when I'm essentially sleepwalking my brain is not working as it used to be um you know I'll walk into a room forget why I went there um my sleep is horrible a lot of breast pain and to make things worse I do have the kinds of implants that are shown to cause uh, breast cancer. So um, I'm going to be going through a lot of testing and testing of the capsules that are going to be removed. And the whole procedure has to be, is very specialized. You can't just go to regular uh, uh, surgeon and get that removed. It has to be done in a specific way. And then um, of course, there's a whole, going to be a whole detox thing. And I've been to uh, healing, there's a website, Healing from Breast Implant Illness, and there's a Facebook group as well. And what's kind of making me angry, they're making women go through these uh, green juice detoxes. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, that's going to make them feel even worse, you know, after the surgery, because there's still a lot of that debris um, and stuff left in there if the capsule is not removed. So some women get more sick afterwards and they're recommending their green juice um, fast and detox stuff. And many women are getting sicker and sicker. And I made few comments on the Facebook group, but there were about going carnivore, trying to heal um, from that after the explant with carnivore diet, but I was, they were deleted or not approved. So that kind of like, 
made me just leave the, the group alone because they're not open to listening any other recommendations. So yeah, this is kind of like what I'm struggling with right now. And it's definitely not the greatest time considering that we're trying to start carnivore snacks and launch everything. So it's definitely had a huge impact on my energy levels and everything else. And it's huge, huge histamine reactions, a lot of hormone issues again. So yeah, I do believe that they have very bad effect on health. Yeah, well, I, I wish you luck with that. Hopefully, that solves some of the you know the issues. You know, I know that's a, that's got to be a tough decision because you know you still don't know for sure what's going to happen. And so, surgery anytime, particularly, uh, is is always uh, you know there's potentials for problems with that. So hopefully that will will see you through. I, I suspect eating a meat based diet will help with the healing process for sure post surgically. I mean, that's that's one. I to be honest, I am. I'm kind of excited because I know I have like this constant low level inflammation in my body from mm -hmm. them, you know, uh, from the breast implants. And if I, if carnivore diet has helped me so much, even with them, uh, uh, you know, with the implants, um, with the inflammation, because it helps immensely. Um, I do, I, I do believe that without that constant inflammation, like I'm going to heal super quickly and recover even better and maybe even help these women out there who do have the ax plant and maybe lead them towards trying carnivore and healing faster because i know of so many of them that are doing the whole vegan thing still you know after explanting and just feeling horrible so i do believe that carnivore diet is going to help me heal even faster afterwards yeah, no, I, I, I suspect so. I mean, I think I don't think it's controversial to say that uh, good nutrition results in um, better healing outcomes. We know, I mean, that's not even remotely con controversial. The question is, what is good nutrition? And as you know, and what most of us here know that a meat-based diet is, is excellent nutrition. Right. Um, so we've got a few more minutes here, Sylvia. Um, I want to ask you, um, you've always been... I guess, always athletic and, and, and exercise, even back in the days when you were on a plant-based diet. Have you noticed, are, are, how, how are you doing with those things now? I mean, are you able to exercise or what's what's going on with your... Um, well, with the whole COVID thing, <laughs> yeah. the gyms are all closed, but now they're actually opening up. But um, I've been able to um, exercise a little bit. Then I went through the whole knee break. So that kind of um set me uh backwards but um i've been doing some exercises and i've been doing dexa scans and stuff like that um after going carnivore and uh, my body uh muscle mass has increased and my bone mass has increased i'm actually gonna do another dexa scan probably in june just to um see what's going on um, because I did um, couldn't lift as heavy as I wanted to because of the knee. So I started low and, and trying to build up, but there's a lot of muscle loss in my right leg right now that it looks like it's coming back. But with the whole breast implant illness thing, I, in my energy is so low right now that you know, whatever energy I have, I, um, I try to save it for my full-time job, job and then I, and my business. So that's that, but I still try to do as much as possible. Yeah, and just for you, I know you, you had a bolster ACL. I think you had a tibial tubercle. Uh, was it a tibial tubercle? No, it was an ACL, uh, spinous spine uh, avulsion. I remember that was the uh, thing well, you had. My, you have, you the, have it screwed down. You had to put a screw back, screw in to screw it back in, yeah. Yeah, they so they um, my tibial eminence snapped, um, mm. so they screwed, but the ACL was still attached to it, so they we, screwed that back, and um, and my meniscus was torn. Yeah. Then after not being able to walk, I went back for, I was still experiencing a lot of pain after a year after the surgery. Um, and so I went back, they did MRI. It turned out that my old soccer ACL injury kind of resurfaced. Um, I don't know how that happened. And then I have cartilage missing on the inside of my knee. So, uh, 
we try and the meniscus is still kind of shredded. So um, I went and I did stem cells on my knee, which has been almost five months post stem cells. And I am noticing that the knee has been improved a lot. And it kind of does feel like the cartilage is regrowing, but we're gonna do another MRI after a year to see um, what's going on in there. Yeah, well, good luck with that. I know that's, that's, uh, that's, you know, <laughs> you just got a lot of challenges ahead of you. So, be so hopefully, yeah. uh, hopefully those things will get better in the near future. So we'll just have to see. Yeah, I'm, I'm confident that they will. Yeah, I think, I think they will. Um, where, where are you living right now? Are you still in Phoenix or are you, or did you move again? Because you've been moving. Yeah, so in Phoenix, I actually saw Zach Bitter on, he was shooting on one of the trails that I ride. And I was going to turn around, but then I saw that he was actually shooting. And then I saw him once again with his wife running the trails. Um, so yeah, still in, in Arizona, hot, hot Arizona. Yeah, because you had moved, you'd moved quite a bit. Um, I'm just trying to see a lot of this, a lot of people just wishing you well and uh, all those things. And I, yeah, I, you know, guys, like I said, let's hopefully support uh, their their venture there. I mean, honestly, I, I have to say, in all honesty, this snack is really, really good. I mean, you guys, will, you guys will enjoy it, and hopefully, you know, with time, uh, it'll, it'll become successful. Um, and I, I don't, you know, like I said, I personally, just from my own personal thing. I think if you can make it taste good, I mean, you know, whatever, you know, whether it's, whether it's uh, pork or beef or lamb or chicken or, you know, venison or elk or whatever, or even the organ meats, I think they'll sell. I do. I think that's, 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 there's going to be, there's going to be a market for that, even outside of the carnivore community. Because again, there are people that eat meat that aren't just on strict carnivore diet. So you've got, you've got, you know, 95% of the U.S. market or you know, whatever, percentage of people that aren't having gone batshit crazy and turned into vegans, you know, the crazy wackos that, uh, yeah. you know, that uh, still there. And hopefully we can, uh, you know, I, I, I just saw an article from in the New York Times posted his opinion piece from a, from a, you know, obviously a prolific vegan, you know, activist guy saying at the end of meat and we need animal, animal, animal agriculture and we all need to, you know, eat plant-based meats and then cultured meats and stuff like that. That's, that's, uh, you know, I mean, obviously there are two ways forward. One is, supporting uh, improvements in the agricultural process, regenerative ag, you know, support the land, support human health, or you can, be, we can all become uh, soybean suckers and, uh, you know, that sort of stuff. Well, anyway, thanks again, Sylvia. Good luck. Let us know how things go. Um, let us know what else we can do to support uh, your endeavors. I know somebody put a link in there on the Kickstarter. Um, so, Anyway, thanks so much for doing what you do and, and, and doing the testing and being a, an advocate for the carnivore diet and putting yourself out there on social media. I know sometimes it's not easy and, you know, there's a lot of uh, negativity gets thrown your oh, way. Yeah. And, sure. and, I, and, I, and I, and I, you know, I, 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 I get that. And, I, and I'm sure starting a company is, is also very stressful, which I, I know <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Okay, guys. Well, thank you so much. Uh, Sylvia, tell people where they can find you and a little bit more, just a quick summary of where you found on social media where you can find the find the uh, information um, about uh, carnivore snacks um my personal account is at biohacking that chick i did start a youtube channel but please don't subscribe um i'll probably not going to be posting much on there i don't have that much time but carnivore snacks are at carnivore that snacks that snacks with an x at the end and you can find a link to our um, Kickstarter there. And today, I believe today is the last day to pledge and support us. So if anybody can, we'll you know, greatly appreciate anything. Thank you. Awesome. Okay, thanks so much, guys. Well, I unfortunately have to go, to, well, unfortunately, I've got to do it. I've got to do a podcast, another podcast. So we'll see everybody tomorrow. I think we've got uh, Anthony uh, Chafee on tomorrow, doctor, another carnivore doctor. So, um, you guys keep keep coming keep coming guys we'll keep the information there and uh you know i didn't see brooke so i wanted to wish her a happy birthday so thank you guys so much uh we'll see you guys soon take care and, and good luck to you sylvia let us know if we can be of support and, and good luck with the surgery thanks thank you all right bye bye guys take care have a great day happy uh thursday <laughs>